praise for your own beloved Son. Thank you that through Christ all the spiritual blessings in heaven have been poured out upon us who believe. Thank you that to be in Christ is to have all the spiritual blessings in heaven. To be outside of Him is to have none of it. And So God, as we study your word, would you open our eyes to behold wondrous truths that we would understand what you mean by what you say and how you've used this, this book, the, the holy word of God, to cause revivals throughout church history and reform your church. Uh, meet with us, we pray in the matchless name of Jesus, amen. Well, take your, take your Bibles, if you would, and join me in Hebrews 4. And while you're making your way to Romans or Hebrews 4, let's just remember where we've gone so far. We looked, first of all, at the first century, which would be the Apostolic Church, and uh, started our time there after we unfolded why we study church history. Then we went to the uh, second through fifth century, dealing with the patristics, which would be the early church fathers, the disciples of the apostles in the early part of that time. Then we got to the Middle Ages from the 6th to the 15th century, the Middle Ages, uh, just go ahead and call them Dark Ages because they were very dark. And that's where we pick up tonight. Our 11th study of church history is the Reformation and Modern Age. This is just the first part. We'll, uh, this will be the time period from the 16th to the 20th century that we will round out our study of church history. And for us to set our thinking upon what drove the Reformation, we find ourselves in Hebrews 4. And verse number 12, Hebrews 4.12, where the writer says, The Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Now, beloved, I trust you believe that. And that is one pregnant verse. This is the only book, even if we got several copies of God's book in our library, this is the only one that when we read it, it reads us. It comes with power. It is what Jeremiah says. It's a hammer that breaks the heart of stone. So that's why when you're putting your testimony together or you're getting ready to share the gospel with somebody, you can share your experience, but your experience doesn't have any power. But you share the Word of God. When, when, when you speak, you speak. But when you share God's Word, God speaks. And it comes in living and active power. And it gets down into the heart where you and uh, our words cannot get to. Now, with this dark period that we begin looking at, the slogan, Post Tenebris Lux, After Darkness Light, described the dawn of a new era of understanding in the church during the Protestant Reformation. The light that shone forth was due to a renewed conviction that Scripture alone, alone, not Scripture and the Roman Catholic Church, is supreme authority for believers. When Martin Luther was asked to explain the mounting success of the Reformation, he responded with unwavering confidence in God's Word. Here's what he said. I simply taught, preached, and wrote God's Word. Otherwise, I did nothing. And while I slept, the Word so greatly weakened the papacy that no prince or emperor ever inflicted such losses upon it. I did nothing. The Word did everything. So the Protestant movement was founded on Scripture alone and therefore it could not be stopped. That's why tonight's midweek Bible study, as we continue to look at church history, we're looking at the Reformation and the modern age 
emphasizing the Word of God, which does it all. You know, if God's Word doesn't have power, I would have resigned yesterday. I've been at this gig for over three decades, and no matter who shows up, when they show up, and what condition they show up, God's Word doesn't return void. Amen? So let's introduce the, the Reformation. There we go. From the human perspective, the 16th century Protestant Reformation was possible due to several factors. Here's how God providentially set things up. Number one, Johann Gutenberg's invention of the movable type printing press around 1450 meant that printed materials could be published quickly and in great quantities rather than having to be copied by hand. Information in books and pamphlets could now be mass produced. You've heard your own pastor loves to kill trees and burn up copiers. Paper's cheap, toner's cheap. How can we shepherd God's uh, people in the truth? Let's, let's write God's word, let's write his truth, let's address issues of our day because the scriptures are sufficient. So Gutenberg's movable press is huge in the providential plan of God in church history. Second of all, the authority and reputation of the papacy declined in the 14th and 15th centuries due to issues like the papal schism that we mentioned last week. European monarchs felt greater freedom to defy papal authority and uh, they're not going to get decapitated for it. Thirdly, the rise of humanism, the study of the humanities motivated European scholars to study ancient works of literature including early manuscripts of the Bible. This led to the recovery of biblical Hebrew and biblical Greek. These factors set the stage for the Protestant Reformation. The 16th century revival and reform movement that dramatically impacted church history. We love the Reformation so much that every year since I've been here pastoring that uh, we highlight Reformation Sunday, the last Sunday of October. Because after darkness, light came. Recapturing of the gospel that saves sinners like us. The true catalyst behind the Reformation was the Word of God. Scripture was studied in its original languages and preached in the vernacular. The Holy Spirit used the truth of His Word to open blind eyes and awaken dead hearts. That's why early Bible translators were willing to seal their convictions with their blood and being burned up because we want to get God's Word into the hands of God's people, into the plowboy's hands. The Reformers were committed to translating the Bible into the common language of Europe. Thanks to the printing press, copies of Scripture were now available to people like never before. The Reformers recognized God's Word as the power behind their movement. Let me uh, share with you just a couple of the Reformer Luther's, uh, what he had to say. He said, by the Word, the earth has been subdued. By the word, the church has been saved, and by the word also it shall be reestablished. Another time he said the Pope said of himself, Luther, Augustine, or even an angel from heaven, these should not be masters, judges, or arbiters, but only witnesses, disciples, and confessors of Scripture. Nor should any doctrine be taught or heard in the church except the pure word of God. Otherwise, let the teachers and the hearers be accursed along with their doctrines, unquote. The Reformers' commitment to Scripture flowed from their conviction that Christ alone is the head of the church, and so His word is the ultimate authority over His church. That Reformation principle, sola scriptura, Scripture alone, is intended to summarize their commitment to the authority and the sufficiency of Scripture. His Word alone is the authority that establishes what we are to believe and how we are to behave. The city of Geneva was an important center during the 16th century Reformation. Here's how the Reformers explained their commitment to the authority of God's Word. In the Geneva Confession of 1536, 
they stated, we affirm that we desire to follow Scripture alone as the rule of faith and religion. It ought to be noted that the Reformers didn't dismiss the value of historical councils and creeds or the writings of the church fathers. We've kind of emphasized this point throughout our study. They rightly understood that all of those things are subject to the authority of Scripture. So armed with a commitment to God and His Word, the Reformers boldly proclaimed the Scriptures in the language of the people. So Reformation was the inevitable result as biblical truth confronted the unbiblical traditions of men. Since the Word is living and it is active and it is powerful, you couldn't help but have Reformation because it's the sword of the Spirit, Ephesians 6.17. So let me mention this dramatic conversion. In July 1505, you've got a 21-year-old law student walking through the German countryside, and Luther unexpectedly found himself caught in a thunderstorm. Fearing for his life, he cried out for help, but he didn't cry out to God for that help. He, he cried out to his patron saint, Saint Anne. And he said, Saint Anne, spare me, and I'll become a monk. Be careful of your rash vows, folks. <laughs> Well, the danger passed, but the pledge Martin Luther made in that moment was a promise he intended to keep. He left behind the study of law, much to his father's dismay, and he entered an Augustinian monastery in the city of Erfurt, located in modern Germany. Though he had escaped the threat of the thunderstorm, he continued to live under the constant threat of God's holy wrath. He knew God's hand of wrath was hovering over him. He felt a, a heavy weight of guilt pressing down on his conscience despite his repeated efforts to assuage it. In keeping with the dominant Roman Catholic thinking of the day, Luther worked tirelessly to try to earn God's favor and pay the punishment for his sins. He performed severe acts of self-asceticism like sleeping without blankets and fasting for long periods. And due to some of these choices he made, he permanently damaged his health. And some of the other reformers did too. Um, you know, they had gut issues, they had hemorrhoid issues, all because of this. So he went to confession so often his confessor had to finally tell him to stop. You're frequent in the confessional too often. Luther's own assessment of, it, of this period of his life was if ever a monk got to heaven by monkery, I would have been that monk. In the midst of the struggle, Luther became fixated with that phrase, the righteousness of God. All Luther could see in that statement was the perfect standard of God's righteousness, and he knew he fell far short of it. Romans 3.23, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. God required righteousness. He didn't have it. For Luther, the righteousness of God stood as a continual reminder of his own condemnation because he rightly recognized he wasn't righteous. And, you know, if you're faithful in your preaching of the gospel to people about their lack of righteousness or, or, or about God's righteousness, they're going to many times walk away because it's going to remind them of their condemnation as well. So just let that settle in. Maybe you'd be here tonight and you're not 100% relying on God's righteousness credited to you for your account. And if so, talk with us, because if you're relying on even a half a percent of your own, you ain't getting into God's kingdom. Well, roughly a def decade after entering the monastery, Luther's despair finally began to lift. He was teaching through the Psalms and Romans and later Galatians, and this desperate monk's eyes were open to the truth of the gospel of grace. You might remember when we introduced our study of the book of Romans, we shared some of his testimony that uh, it was through Romans that he came to faith in Christ. Especially Romans 1, 16 and 17. He came to see that the righteousness of God revealed in the gospel isn't merely the righteous standard of God, 
but also the righteous provision of God in which God reckons believers as righteous by clothing them in the perfect righteousness of His Son. It's one thing to recognize that God requires you to be absolutely holy, but to have such a gracious and good God that would provide the righteousness that you couldn't provide, that He requires, that's the best of both worlds. Luther summarized this remarkable discovery with these exuberant words. He said, at last, meditating day and night by the mercy of God, I gave heed to the context of the words that in it the righteousness of God is revealed. As is written, he through faith is righteous shall live. And then I began to understand that the righteousness of God is that through which the righteous live by, by a gift of God, namely by faith. Here I felt as if I were entirely born again at an entered paradise itself through the gates, of that, the gates that had been flung open. An entirely new side of the Scriptures opened itself to me, and I extolled my sweetest word with a love as great as the loathing with, which had been with me before I hated the term, the righteous of God." Thus, that verse in Paul, Romans 1, 8, 1, 17, was for me truly the gate to paradise. Luther's decade-long struggle was characterized by frustration and despair. It ended with the good news of the gospel. As a sinner, he could never earn a right standard before God, but through faith he could be forgiven, he could be clothed in the perfections of Christ. Luther would later identify this as the great exchange of the gospel. The penalty for the believer's sin imputed or reckoned to Christ who paid that penalty on the cross, and at the same time, the perfect righteousness of Christ imputed to the believer who is declared righteous by God. You got the gospel in a nutshell in 2 Corinthians 5.21, do you not? He made him who knew no sin to be made sin for us that we might be made righteous of God through him. The great exchange, our sin to Christ, His righteousness to us. No message is more important than the good news of God's grace. No sinner is good enough to earn God's favor. We all stand desp in desperate need of divine mercy. So all the drama that surrounded Luther might be unique to him. We don't all come to Christ through a thunderstorm or through a, a study and teaching of the book of Romans where the teacher gets saved along with the students. We simultaneously celebrate the wonder of our own testimony, though, that we've been saved by grace, not by works, so that no one can boast. Maybe like Luther, I've been working with some of y'all about putting your testimony together. I'd love to the privilege, if you've not put your story of conversion together, make sure you reach out and we will walk through that with you. So let's continue in, in Luther before we get to some of these other reformers. Last week, we introduced indulgences, pardons that supposedly reduce the punishment for sin. In the medieval church, they issued indulgences in exchange for money. You give us your tithes, we'll give you time out of purgatory. This selling of indulgences became an important source of income for the papacy. How else are they going to make the, build these massive cathedrals unless you keep the people under your thumb? So in 1517, church authorities commissioned a monk by the name of Johann Tetzel to sell indulgences through Saxony. By the, this time, Luther was teaching at the University of Wittenberg, when Tetzel began selling indulgences near Wittenberg, Luther was incensed. He couldn't take it anymore. To articulate his concerns, Luther drafted a list of 95 arguments against the abuse of indulgences. This treatise was written in Latin and was intended for interchurch debate. Somehow Luther's Latin document was translated into German. The printing press made it possible for copies to be quickly distributed throughout Saxony and the surrounding regions. He gave voice to popular concerns about corruption in the church. 
But in spite of the growing outcry, Roman Catholic authorities were slow to respond. Initially, the Pope hoped it would be handled within the Augustinian monastic order of which Luther was a part. Let them handle it. July 15, 19, Luther debated a man named Johann Eck on the topic of papal authority. Luther admitted that he admired the teachings of Jan Hus. Remember Goose Boy that we talked about a couple weeks ago? Uh, well, that's a dangerous thing to associate with Hus because Hus had been executed as a heretic, and yet that was one of Luther's heroes. Fast forward a year, June 1520, Pope Leo X issued a decree called a papal bull that threatened to excommunicate Luther if he would not recant. Luther refused to relinquish his views. He's excommunicated in January of 1521. He's subsequently summoned by Emperor Charles X to an imperial council called a diet in the city of Worms. You might call it Worms, but that's not good German. Luther arrived in April and was presented with a list of his alleged heresies. But Luther still refused to recant, and many of you are familiar with these words. He said, Since then, your majesty and your lordships desire a simple reply, I will answer without horns and without teeth. Unless I am convinced by Scripture and plain reason, I do not accept the authority of popes and councils, for they have contradicted each other. My conscience is captive to the Word of God. I cannot and I will not recant anything, for to go against conscience is neither right nor safe. God help me. Amen. The following month, May of 1521, Luther was declared a notorious heretic by the emperor. This designation made him an outlaw and put his life in danger. So it's time to get out of Dodge. Luther's political protector was a prince in the Holy Roman Empire named Frederick, Frederick III, also known as Frederick the Wise, if you learned about him in history. Knowing Luther was in imminent danger, Frederick sent men to kidnap Luther and take him into hiding. Using the pseudonym Junker George or Squire George, Luther spent most of the next year in Wartburg Castle. And while there, he translated the New Testament from Greek into the German language. This translation was completed early in 1522. Again, he's just playing with fire. You don't do that. His German translation would be influential on the translation efforts of William Tyndale, who was translating the New Testament into English, a task that was finally completed three years later in 1525. This time in Luther's life illustrates his commitment to the authority of Scripture. I don't care what it takes to get God's Word into the hands of God's people. He refused to waver in his commitment to biblical truth, even when threatened by the Pope and the Emperor. And that same conviction motivated his translation efforts because he recognized the need to make the Scripture available to the common people. Now, yesterday was our next-to-last lesson in our hermeneutics class at Grace Bible Church. And uh, so I, I got I to gotta give you this footnote on uh, Luther's emphasis on literal interpretation. Uh, since we looked at consistent literal interpretation uh, uh, the previous time. This coming from Lawson's little uh, biography of, of Luther. I thought I was, if I could find it. I probably wrote the wrong page number. Ah, there we go. So he's, Dr. Lawson says, uh, he sought to discover the Bible's plain or normal meaning. Those phrases ought to sound familiar from your teaching. He sought to discover the Bible's plain or normal meaning. By taking this approach, he abandoned the traditional allegorical interpretation of the word in order to pursue the grammatical historical sense. Wow, 
See, we aren't the first ones practicing this consistently uh, literal, grammatical, historical interpretation. Tragically, the Bible had been spiritualized for centuries preceding the Reformation. Consequently, its essential message had been lost by many. But Luther reversed this trend and sought to understand its plain meaning. Luther warned against the seductive lure of spiritualizing a biblical text. Luther said an allegory is like a beautiful harlot who fondles men in such a way that it's impossible for her not to be loved. Now, we may not talk quite the way that uh, crass Luther would, but he understood an allegorizing, uh, that allegorizing can make the Bible seem to say anything, twisting its meaning. You can make the Bible mean whatever you want. Thus, allegorical interpretations are to be rejected, he said, as empty speculations and the froth of Holy Scripture. Luther confessed that he had been earlier enticed by the allegorical approach, but he'd seen a better way. He said, when I was young, and especially before I was acquainted with theology, I dealt largely in allegories and tropes and a quantity of idle craft, but now I have let all that slip, and my best craft is to give the Scripture with its plain meaning, for the plain meaning is learning and life. He was saying I was non-theological and basically stupid when I was using allegory. Elsewhere, he said, when I was a monk, I was a master in the use of allegories. I allegorized everything. Afterward, through the epistle to the Romans, I came to some knowledge of Christ. I recognized then that allegories are nothing, that it is not what Christ signifies, but what Christ is that counts. Once converted, Luther could no longer strain the meaning of Scripture. Elsewhere, he claimed, we must everywhere adhere to the simple, pure, and natural meaning of the words. This accords with the rules of grammar and the usage of speech which God has given to men. For if everyone is allowed to invent conclusions and figures of speech according to his own whim, nothing could to a certain certainty be determined or proved concerning any one article of faith that men could not find fault with by means of some figure of speech. Rather, we must avoid as the most deadly poison all figurative language which Scripture itself does not force us to find in a passage. So if you're going to go figurative, let the words of Scripture make you go that way because it's there. Literal interpretation became one of the distinguishing features of the Reformation. How about the heart of the gospel? In keeping with their commitment to the authority of Scripture, Luther and his fellow reformers looked to God's Word to define the heart of the gospel. During the previous Middle Ages, the doctrine of justification had had been confused and distorted even like it's being distorted by so-called reform brothers today that are still mixing works with justification. Roman Catholics saw justification as a gradual process by which the sinner was made righteous over a long period of time. This process involved both God's grace and the sinner's efforts to perform good works. It's a both or, a both and, not either or. Part of the confusion about justification was due to the Latin translation of the Greek term. The Latin term justificare could mean to make righteous and lent itself towards a process. But the Greek term, since he was going back to the original languages, dikaiosune means to declare righteous. It's a one-time act from the Father, not a process speaks of that judicial verdict at a moment in time. With the rediscovery of biblical Greek, the reformers were careful to correct the erroneous notion that justification was a process procured on part by good works. Rather, it's a divine pardon issued at the moment of conversion in which God declares the sinner to be righteous, justified based on the atoning work and the imputed righteousness of Jesus. So the Reformers taught that believers are saved by grace alone, you know the phrase sola gratia, 
Through faith alone, sola fide, in the person and work of Christ alone, solus Christos, and all the glory for their salvation goes to God alone, soli Dea Gloria. And where do they find all this? Sola Scriptura, the Scriptures alone. They recognized the vital importance of repentance, but clearly saw good works as the evidence or the fruit of justification, not the cause or root of it. Martin Luther dis- distinguished the biblical gospel from Roman Catholic teaching by differentiating between the theology of the cross, which is the biblical view, and the theology of glory, the Roman view. The theology of the cross emphasized that human beings can do nothing to, an- own their, to earn their own righteousness before God, nor can they add anything to the righteousness provided for them through Christ. Any righteousness given to them comes from outside of them. That's why it was called an alien righteousness. It's not a righteousness within, but outside. On the other hand, the theology of glory, as Luther called it, taught that even after the fall, there remained some ability in sinful people to achieve their own righteousness before God. This view implied that part of the credit or glory for salvation belongs to the sinner. So Luther and his fellow reformers rejected this and rightly insisted that all the glory for salvation belongs to God alone. Let me give you a couple of representative statements from these reformers on justification by grace through faith alone. For Luther, he said, through faith in Christ, therefore, Christ's righteousness becomes our righteousness, and all that He has becomes ours. Rather, He Himself becomes ours. This is an infinite righteousness and one that swallows up all sin in a moment, for it is impossible that sin should exist in Christ. On the contrary, he who trusts in Christ exists in Christ. He is one with Christ, having the same righteousness as he. And if that's not clear enough, he said, so making a happy change with us, Christ took upon him our sinful person and gave us his innocent and victorious person wherewith we being now clothed are freed from the curse of the law. By faith alone, therefore, We are made righteous, for faith lays hold of this innocence and victory of Christ Himself. When John Calvin came along, I think I got my notes later. He's about 25 years uh, later. Calvin said, justified by faith is he who, excluded from the righteousness of works, grasps the righteousness of Christ through faith, and clothed in it, appears in God's sight not as a sinner, but as a righteous man, no longer sinner, but saint. Calvin said, we are justified before God solely on the intercession of Christ's righteousness. This is equivalent to saying that man is not righteous in himself, but because the righteousness of Christ is communicated to him by imputation. In other words, it's been credited to him. There are so many teachings of Scripture that the Reformers return to, I've listed for you some of those uh, key passages which if you don't have plans for your devotions tomorrow morning, there you go. There's some of the texts. So let's move on from Luther to Calvin because uh, our, our time is just about spent. Calvin was born in, in France, 1509, like I said, 25 years younger than Luther. As such, Calvin represents the second generation of Protestant reformers. So Luther's first generation, Calvin's second. Calvin was converted in the early 1530s. Like Luther, he had been studying to be a lawyer before God changed the course of his life. What is it with lawyers? You know, and all the lawyer jokes in the church today. Can there be a Christian lawyer? I think there can be, but these guys gave up being a lawyer to become preachers and theologians of the gospel. When persecution against Protestants erupted in France, Calvin had to flee to Switzerland. So while in Basel, he penned his first edition of the Institutes of the Christian Religion, published in 1536. Later that same year, he was planning to travel to Strasbourg, 
His journey took him through Geneva where another reformer named William Farrell convinced him to stay and help lead the Protestant church in Geneva. In 38, Farrell and Calvin came into conflict with the city council and were forced to leave Geneva. Calvin traveled to Strasbourg where he got married and published his first commentary in the Book of Romans and came out with the second edition of the Institutes of Christian Religion. I've said less about Calvin than I have about Luther, and I'll say even less about the others. But these are guys, you ought to at least know the names and kind of what their part was in the Reformation. For instance, Philip Melanchthon was a close associate of Luther in Wittenberg. He was the principal author of the Augsburg Confession, which was presented to Emperor Charles V at the Diet of Augsburg in 1530. The Augsburg Confession is one of the most important documents in Lutheran history. Then you've got Ulrich Zwingli, Protestant reformer in Zurich, who is considered the father of the Reformed branch of the Reformation. He convinced the Zurich City Council to allow him to make sweeping ecclesiastical reforms, including the abolishment of the Mass. That's a huge reform for the church. He's a contemporary of Luther. The two agreed on many doctrinal issues but differed sharply on their understanding of the Lord's table. Then comes to front and center stage William Tyndale. English Bible translator who flees Europe because translating was illegal in England at the time. He translated the New Testament from Greek and the the Pentateuch from Hebrew. 1536, he's arrested, executed by command of Henry VIII, the King of England. And his translation efforts laid the groundwork for subsequent English Bible translations. So that Bible in your lap you ought to be thanking God for raising up men like Tyndale. Thomas Cranmer, Protestant Archbishop of Canterbury, helped spark the Reformation in England during the reigns of Henry VIII and Edward VI. Cranmer was executed for his faith by Mary I. You may not know Mary I very well. You know her better by her other name, Bloody Mary. And then how about John Knox? Scottish reformer who was exiled to England and then to Europe before returning to Scotland to lead the Reformation efforts there. He too came into conflict with Roman Catholic ruler Mary, Queen of Scots, and in the end, Knox brought Reformed theology to Scotland, thereby founding Presbyterianism. Now I read for you a portion of uh, Martin Luther's biography, and one thing I have neglected to encourage you in in your spiritual disciplines throughout our church history series is the edifying value of good biographies. And uh, years ago, I was acquainted with this new series that Dr. Steve Lawson was put together called A Long Line of Godly Men. And there's a lot of people, I've I've learned as a biblical counselor, I keep a lot of biblical booklets, not books, uh, because you show somebody a book and they get scared. But you know, look at how tiny these are. Anybody, nobody should be scared away by a biography this small of John Calvin or William Tyndale or Martin Luther. I thought I had a quote I was going to close with, with uh, from Knox, but I, uh, I forgot. But why don't we pray, shall we? Father, thank you again. We understand that the uh, writings of early church fathers are not on par with Scripture. Only the Scriptures are inspired by you, finding their source in you. These words of Scripture have been recorded without error. They're authoritative over our lives. They're sufficient to answer the questions and the issues of life. God, give us a greater conviction of sola scriptura like these reformers. Continue to raise up people in our day who reform your church with the Word of God and hack out worldly and human traditions.
in favor of the Word of God. God, might we be these kind of men, men of God who, if called to, would seal these convictions with our own blood. We continue to pray for persecuted brethren around the globe. Would you persevere them? Would you give them your sustaining grace? And Lord, as things even get more difficult for religious freedom here in our own country, help us not to sell out, help us not to waffle, but to be shining lights that are faithful to the very end. For Christ's sake we ask it. Amen.